Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher. I'm the founder of Metatomics, and I'm on a never-ending quest for knowledge. A quest is a search for something, and this podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. To me, curiosity is part of what makes us human, and there's still so much we don't know. I believe there's joy in discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. And with that, welcome to Season 4 of the Quest Podcast. I hope you enjoy this next interview. Hi, Kama. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Hi, Todd. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you as a guest. I just started Season 4, so I've got a lot of really cool people coming on. Really looking forward to this interview today. Um, and I think you have a lot to uh, contribute and talk about. And uh, you're, you're very popular in the wellness industry. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about young Kima. Tell me about your early life, how you grew up. Did you grow up spiritual or religious? Young Kima, I love that. It's, um yeah, a little bit. So I have a huge extended family and they I have something like 55 cousins on my dad's side alone. Wow. And all of them are very faith-based, religious, Christian roots. I was not raised in that way though. My parents raised me very spiritually and I loved that. But I also had this weird sense of FOMO where I watched them and I was like, they have this faith and I wish I had that faith. And so I started exploring a lot of different religions actually and reading on them, just trying to see what resonated. And I found that none of them really truly stuck for me, um, but I loved pieces and parts of them. And that is exactly how my parents raised me. So I really just came back to the roots that my parents raised me with and um kind of just chose a spiritual path of of what fits and what doesn't. Um, my parents preached a lot of things around astrology and, and nature and uh, unity, the power of prayer, but with no, again, specific faith. And I always just felt really comforted and called to it. So I would say I definitely had a heavy spiritual base just growing up and some influences that shaped me that turned me away and all the things that ended up becoming what I am today. Sure. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a little, I always say like a little trifecta between mostly Marin County. So the Bay area in Northern California. Um, so from the Redwoods to then also I grew up part-time in Mexico. I even went to school there in elementary school in Cabo San Lucas, which is like a total joke to everyone. They're like, nobody lives in Cabo San Lucas. Um, or goes, goes to, to school party. there. <laughs> yeah, or goes to school there. The school but of I drinking. Did. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Squid Row. Um, no, I went and I actually went to elementary school. So I learned Spanish and um, that was a huge part of my upbringing too, was even when we didn't live there, so spending a lot of time in Cabo. And, th and then I'm lucky to add this one grew up part-time on Maui. So to wow. me, Maui felt like home and I was traveling a lot with my family. So it was really interesting, this concept of home, because we were on the go, like we were on the road. My parents joke when I was born, they like put me in a baby backpack and just <laughs> kept doing what they always did. So, um, for me to connect it really home, this, um, this idea of home was, just this connection it was a connection more than anything else and I definitely felt that on Maui so that uh triangle you're explaining there the Pacific Triangle maybe we would call yeah, it I don't know. <laughs> we could give it its name yeah I know there's a the Pacific Triangle I love that we'll, we'll take there, that well there's already kind of this west coast attitude people have anyways you know there's certainly 
um, you know, a, like a feel with people that are there, but you incorporate Hawaii into that or, Ma or Maui into that, or, you know, uh, that living is also uniquely different. So yes. it really kind of a perfect storm, so to speak, of interesting places mm -hmm. to live, you know? Oh my gosh. And also just some of the most beautiful places. So I'm so, so lucky. And I always talk about how ecosystems sculpt you too. And like I was saying, from the redwoods to like the deserty beach of Mexico to this lush jungle environment, I feel like all of those pieces have totally formed aspects of me too. They have formed you because you would probably be a completely different person if you grew up in LA. <laughs> oh yes, I agree. And then I did move to LA and I think it added a whole new thing. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I lived in California for about 10 years and, um, oh, wow. and I worked in LA, but I lived in Ventura County, uh, which probably nice. kept me alive a lot longer <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Than just being in LA in the entertainment industry, and, you know, Oof, because yeah. that, that's rough. It's, that's a rough, like anytime a big city living is something anyways, but yeah. Um, but whenever you can get away to like the beach communities, you know, some beautiful, like it really is a great way to decompress. And uh, so I need to be, be near water. That's my thing. It's like, if I'm not near water, I go like stir crazy. Like it's I just hear something you. That I'm drawn to, I've got to be near. I, and although I did, I was born and grew up in the Midwest, I was mm -hmm. near the Ohio river. So I was always near like a body of water. But when I'm landlocked, I just am not right. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's such a real thing. There's a thing. Um, I don't know if you've read the book Blue Mind, but I can't remember the author right now, but it is about how literally the brain heals around water and just mm -hmm. seeing water is so healing to our brains. So yeah, you're not you alone. Know, well, there is something, you know, what I love about water more than really any other element is there is a sound, there's a sight, there's a feel to it. So it really consumes all of you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really love about it is it just, it uses all your senses. So and, uh, and I think that's the key to the, the being near water in terms of a call, having a calming effect or making you feel, feel great. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. How, how old were you when you started to get interested in wellness? When did you, when did you take your first yoga class? Like what was, what was the beginning? What was the birth of that movement for you? Oh my gosh. It's such a good question. I think it, because like I said, I grew up with truly such spiritual roots. Um, I found wellness being kind of integral in all of these different various elusive ways but when I really started getting into it, um, truly consciously choosing it, deep diving into it was actually when I was 18 and I went through this massive breakup of my first relationship. It was too intense for a young teen and I was in it from 13 to 18. So I almost had this rebirth of identifying with myself again, both as a young adult, even as a teen um, just as an autonomous human being. And I know 18 and moving out of the house is kind of a big break in that way, but it was a double whammy for me. I had this breakup and I moved out at the same time. Wow. And so, um, and it was so powerful because I just at my own kind of rock bottom decided I needed to find things that brought me back home to myself and gave me um, this reinforced sense of actually self-confidence was my word at the time. So I opened my world to absolutely everything. I actually, speaking of cults, um, joined a few cults for a minute by accident, ended up <laughs> <laughs> bought into all the crystal. I mean, not that these are necessarily like not helpful things, but went down every rabbit hole you can imagine with wellness and just explored. And I actually think it was really important for me because I ended up just taking what stuck and leaving what didn't kind of like I did in my early spiritual journey. So um, wellness became so key. I've always, so I got into yoga in high school and meditation. I'd say I dabbled in, in my youth, my mom actually had a meditation teacher. And I remember the first time I did both yoga and meditation, two separate events, I just sobbed and it was actually really intense. And I was like an angsty, super angsty teen. So I was like, I don't want to go through this. I don't like this. Um, but later in my life, when I needed it the most, I realized how important it was to go through those emotions. Um, so my wellness journey has many start points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're a, a yoga and a meditation instructor and you're a Reiki master. So you've added these yeah. to your repertoire of things that you do now, which is common. I hear this with a lot of people that come on the show. 
to do what you do. But so I'm curious, you know, do you think that all those things kind of have to come hand in hand? Do or they, does it become something that becomes a business practice? Is it for you? Is it for clients? How do you kind of break that down? Such a good question. So I started all of the studies, all of the cert- certifications I have, I got out of healing for myself. I didn't do them to become a teacher or a coach or a healer. I did them for me. And it was so interesting because I just graduated college and I did what I didn't know at the time I was doing, but a practice that in Hawaii they call holo holo. And I talk about this all the time because it's the most beautiful practice. We don't have a word for it in English, but it's basically following the poles. So wherever you're being pulled, you just say yes and you go. And I had about a year uh, after college where I just holo holoed my way through all these different trainings, starting with Hawaiian healing, which was so beautiful, to yoga, to meditation, to then becoming a Reiki master. And every teacher I had was like, you need to teach. I was like, I (laughs) I don't think I want to teach. Uh, It came for me. I came to just like learn more and feel good and whatever. And they were like, no, I think you should teach. So by the end of all that whole year, I decided to just put it out there and, and see if it felt good to teach. And it was the most and is the most fulfilling thing in the world to me. So when you asked uh, which one, like, do you need them all together? Do they, because there are so many that I ended up studying. The reason why I did it for myself at the time without fully knowing, because like I said, it was more of like an intuitive thing, is each one of those areas of my expertise covers uh, a different dimension of self. So Hawaiian healing, to me, that was the most deeply spiritual training and experience I've ever had in my life. The next one was, of course, meditation, and meditation is so mental. It's so much about working and befriending and navigating the mind. The next one was emotional to me, which was, or Reiki was later, but I'm just going to go in that order. Reiki, emotional to me. I know it's energy-based, but so much came up for me emotionally and for my clients comes up emotionally and it really feels almost like an alignment of your emotions, um, working with your emotions and of course yoga being so physical and all of those different things cover so many different areas. Reiki can be physical, yoga can be mental, like it's all the different, all encompassings, but I loved having these specific kind of niches that covered the dimensions of self. I came out feeling more whole. Um, like I tended to all these pieces and parts of me and understood the language of each of those pieces and parts of me. And that's how I work with my clients too. They come and I'm like, you are whole. We need to address each of these facets with different approaches. Right. So that's pretty much that. So with Reiki in particular, yeah, you must have had you must have had Reiki performed on you. So you must have had an experience with that to want to move toward that, right? Because that kind of has to come first. So this is going to sound crazy, but I had actually never had a true Reiki session. Wow, okay. (laughs) Funny that you asked that. Um, No, never. And I'd heard of it and I believed in it. I just never like right place, right time, like worked it out and aligned it for myself. But it was another one of those things where I was like, I need this. I don't know why, but I need this. I need to know this. I need to experience this. And here I am. But yeah, of course, now I've received Reiki in many ways and forms, but no, not until I'd become certified. Interesting. I hadn't heard the term Hawaiian healing before. Let's dig into that a little bit more. Totally. So Hawaiian healing is something that is, I mean, it's so general. It's so vague. I call myself a student of Hawaiian healing um, because it's not my culture's practice. It's obviously something I went to study. Um, But because I grew up on Maui part-time, I had such, and I told you it felt like home always, I had such a deep connection with the land and the spirit of the land and the history that I really wanted to know more. And that's where my journey in certifications began. I just said, yes, I went to a training that Actually, a good friend of mine who was a massage therapist was going to go to, and she was studying under this world-renowned Lomi Lomi practitioner. And I was like, you know what? I don't even 
care to do massage ever in my life, but I'm going to do this training with you. And that was only one of the pieces. So we studied, um, Lomi Lomi. We studied, um, hot stone healing, working Ili Ili. Then we studied, um, uh, basically La'au Lapa'au, which, which translates to plant medicine, nothing psychedelic. It's literally just like juicy, beautiful, working with fruits and flowers and leaves and teas and poultices and basically letting the plants speak to you and through you in order to have a connection and work with your body and work with spirit and heal yourself or your client or whoever you're dealing with. So I don't practice Hawaiian healing in the way that I studied it now um, because I don't have at the moment I'm I'm not in Hawaii I'm not on the grounds but I do believe and I I I teach the philosophy of how the Hawaiians worked with the land for my clients to work with themselves with spirit with nature because the real principle is that nature has all the answers like heals like and such beautiful deep profound vibrations in the Hawaiian language oh my gosh it's like Sanskrit to me but almost to me even more powerful um so sometimes we work with Hawaiian mantra and it just depends on the situation but we'll drop a mantra and they'll meditate on it and just feel the power of that beautiful beautiful ancient language for sure what's your daily self-care routine Oh my goodness. Great question. Um, it changes because I'm like a self-care wellness junkie. So I love trying new things and seeing what fits. And it also depends on the day. I love to say like, meet yourself as you are. There's no one size fits all. There's no one size fits you. So for me as a general rule of thumb, it usually begins with a morning meditation practice and it's anywhere from five to 25 minutes. Um, It's changed over time, but that's my window. That's my sweet spot. And then I'll do usually a yoga practice for about 30 minutes to an hour. Um, then it's usually incorporating some walks, some nature. I like to just like get it all done in the morning, but then I sprinkle in my little like nature moments throughout the day. Um, and it has to do with also just being intuitive with my body. So if it's wanting some certain kind of movement, or if it needs a break at this time, if it needs a bath today, if I need like just whatever it is, I really, the practice of self-care to me is just honoring and listening to what I need. So but those are my like standard formats. Yeah. Well, that feeds into some of my speed questions I'm about to give you because you answered some of them already, actually things I was going to ask, but I'm going to jump into some. So these are just like quick answer questions. Fun. Um, So I I was going to ask, do you meditate every day? And if so, for how long? And you answered that one. So we'll move on. How much Mm -hmm. sleep do you get each night? Oh my God, like 10 hours. And if I could get 25 hours of sleep, I would. (laughs) I am like, I am such a sleep advocate. And I also am, I can sleep forever. It's actually really strange. And I've been trying to figure out what it is. (laughs) I can sleep. I could sleep. If I don't set an alarm, I won't wake up. So um, lots of hours. (laughs) Wow. Wow. I, w- I thought you were going to tell me like four hours of sleep. I thought you no. were like an incredibly busy person, but no, oh it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> oh my God. No, no, no. Like that's just such a key. I should, didn't, I should have mentioned that's a key part of my self-care. I just have to get my sleep and then I'll like power through whatever. What are your daily eating habits like <laughs> oh my when gosh. you're not sleeping? <laughs> yeah. When I'm not sleeping, uh, when I'm not in hibernation, I usually am morning routine is it it, again it varies and I also spend my time between California and Puerto Rico right now so Mm. very different climates very different foods very different things my body is yearning and craving but since it's summer right now um that is my morning smoothie is my go-to some protein um some fruits some just whatever powders and elixirs I want to add in that I'm craving I will do that and then later in the day I'll have and I like to eat later so I'm not an intermittent faster by like conscious choice but my body is just not hungry till later so I eat around like 11 30 then I'll have lunch shortly after and it's usually something like some kind of grains I am vegetarian so some kind of grains lots of veggies Maybe it's a delicious salad with quinoa and all kinds of like veggies and delicious things like that. Um, And then for dinner, some kind of bowl, but honestly, 
burrito pizza like I will <laughs> I'm not a I'm not like a purist I'm just a balanceist right Sure. so everything like healthy during the day then I'll give like myself that one meal where I'm like I'm gonna eat what I want so and I do love dessert there's definitely no um Well, my, my next question was guilty pleasures. <laughs> so, oh my god I have so many guilty pleasures um sweets I love them I uh I don't like this is the thing I don't I didn't I truly in high school I had an eating disorder and I was so bingy purgy and it is something that I any given opportunity I have so I'm glad you asked about food it's so important that I share that for me it's just been about listening to my body feeling what feels good and then if I really want you know a cupcake I'll freaking have a cupcake And that has been the absolute most healing thing I could do for myself. So guilty pleasure. I don't even know if I want to throw it in there because sometimes it's medicine. Sometimes it's just the greatest joy. Um, Sure. and I know not everyone would agree, but Do there's you take that. vitamin It's supplements? so funny you say that. Yeah, I actually love this brand, um, Naturello. It's right next to me or Naturello. It's just a multivitamin, but my doctor was like all time favorite vitamin. take it. And I love it. So that's pretty much all I take. And you mentioned what your exercise is every day. So you pretty much do yoga. Do you do anything else? Do you do anything aerobic or do you run or do you? I, so I get into different phases, as I said, with whatever wellness thing I'm trying out. And I mean, even right now I'm doing a Pilates series and every once in a while I'll dabble in Pilates every once in a while I'll do some bar um every once in a while high intensity interval training though that is my least favorite for sure um running not my fave at all I would pretty much rather do anything but run <laughs> so if it's outdoor or hiking or um dancing I've done quite a few online I got into belly dance for a little bit but it's always changing it just depends on like what sounds fun and that's my philosophy with movement too is like what sounds fun move your body in that way so yeah for it sure varies I've saved the most important question for last of the speed round here and this is a good one it's super important the fans really want to know what's your favorite Sammy Hagar song Oh my God. <laughs> Shoot. I should have known. Um, I actually, that's such a good question. And it's hilarious that I don't have a, I don't have like a ready answer for you, but I feel like if I had, woo. okay, give me a second. Give me a second. <laughs> Want me to tell you mine while you're waiting? While I'm waiting. Yeah. 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 Tell me yours. So I have to say, I can't drive 55 is my favorite, but I am a, like an insane Sammy Hagar Van Halen fan. <laughs> so, There you so go. that's like some of my best stuff right there as some of the stuff I, I love the most, but, uh, yeah. but I had to, you don't even have to answer it, but you know, no, I no, just had I to do put you wanna, on the spot. No, no, I do want to answer it for you. I think it's a fair question. I should have an answer for I think if I were to give you two that mean a lot to me and they're going to be for different reasons like the first one is almost a copy a cop out but um I don't know if you know this but my dad actually wrote a song called Kema and that came out the year I was born and obviously it's the most sentimental song it like makes me cry to this day <laughs> and like oh it's just beautiful and it will be such an important piece of my whole life so yeah. obviously the most touching um but I also would say if I was talking on not that because that is a bit of a cop out I think dr when dreams um I think that's a really beautiful anthem and I think it says so much about the way that my dad raised me too it doesn't say about that but that to me just relates exactly to how he raised all of his kids which was I always say the best thing that my parents did was say you guys be and be whoever you want in this world and follow your dreams they never shoved anything down our throats they never tried to make us into anything and you can see that through all of my siblings my little sister is literally a cowgirl um i am a holistic wellness coach my brother andrew is a musician but formerly he was a fighter an mma fighter and then my oldest brother is an artist um and i just love i love that it just says so much about following your dreams and Yeah. we were so lucky to have that um language in our house and I want to ask you know being the daughter of a public figure 
is it hard to find your own way out of a shadow like that? Because I think a lot of people think that um, they feel that children of celebrities have some form of entitlements or don't have it as hard as other people. Um, mm -hmm. it, let's talk to that for a second. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so it is a really interesting piece that I actually um, one day I will write a book on that um, <laughs> a sneak peek. One day I will, because it is such an interesting conversation and topic. So I've also, I've been able to be in that first hand, hand position. I've also watched it from a third party witness perspective of others in my position and also of myself. Once I started studying mental health and meditation, became a witness to my own experience, right? So I, I speak on this with a lot of different perspectives. Um, I think that I'm so aware of my privilege and my experience that so much comes to me so much easier than it would for most people. And that keeps me up at night. If you were going to ask me that question, that would be the answer that that gives me such um, almost guilt that I've had to grapple with my entire life. And formerly, I mean, I've, I've been through so many waves of this where I've like tried to lean into it or I've tried to branch away or like rebel from it or overly compensate and fawn about it because I want to make sure that everybody doesn't think I am the way that they perceive me. And it's finding the balance of both owning that piece of me um, and letting, of course, the truth of me shine because I am who I am. I didn't choose this life or maybe I did. I don't know. Um, and here I am. So I think what's so important for people in my position or privileged positions like this is to help in all the ways that you can and be the absolute brightest, best version of you so that you can be a liaison, so that you can be a role model, so that you have, if you have the mic, use the mic in all the best ways that you can. Um, it is what it is. It's my life. Do I think it's fair? No, I actually don't. <laughs> but uh, that's my experience. It's a really complex one, full of so many highs and full of so much complication. So well, what yeah. I think is interesting in your case <clears throat> versus, you know, other other children of, of celebrities that I that I know personally is, you know, this isn't so cut and dried as like, um, you know, your parent, you know, creates a fashion line for you and, or, you know, creates all types of opportunities that, you know, it's a, a basically built with money, right? Right, right? What you do is uniquely you. Only you can really teach yoga the way you teach it. Only you can, can guide someone in meditation the way you can. Only you can perform Reiki the way you can. They're very interpersonal skills that no one else can help with. So you have to be gifted to do that. So, public figure's daughter or not, you develop these skills on your own and everything that you've built, everything that orbits you is you, you know? So I don't okay. think there's any entitlement there at all. You know, you might, I'd... you might have got to fly on a private plane <laughs> <laughs> to yep. all the concerts in the world, but, but yeah. you know, you know what I mean? Like what you yeah. built for yourself, your enterprise is you, that's all right. you. And, and everything you, you talk about, everything that uh, guides the vision of where this, this company goes and, and the retreats that you have and the classes you teach is all uniquely you. And Thank that's what you. you should be proud of right there. I appreciate it. And it's always nice to hear it mirrored back. I mean, it's true that everything I've built at this point has been, you know, me up on my computer, writing all night, sending emails, connecting with people, you know, doing the cold calls. And of course, though, there's always that extra level of, oh, because you are who you are welcome sure. in to the place that nobody else would have the keys to so right. it doesn't mean I haven't done the work it just does mean that yeah there are some accelerators and I'm conscious of that so so there's a yeah there's truth to both sides and I'm when I, just uh, want to say it. when I launched this <laughs> podcast it was a month before um COVID really hit <laughs> so yeah, the first couple yeah. episodes we were in, in studios and like everything was all professionally done. And then a month later, the world was shut down mm. and, uh, and I live in New York. So I was in ground zero of it. So everything became wow. zoom. Right. But yeah. since COVID, I really, you know, you see the cities come back, you see mandates lifted on things and masks or not masks, you know, you see everything start to drift away, 
but I still feel like there's a profound amount of healing that the public needs to do. I think a lot of people had their worlds rocked during COVID. There were people yeah. that didn't have family or boyfriends or girlfriends that were alone in their apartments. They now had no more job. They had no more income coming in. Yeah. They didn't even have an animal. Like, you know, people got into really dark places. Yeah. And I've talked about this before that I, I feel like during COVID, we saw maybe the best in social media because I saw a lot of people that would, uh, you know, comedians who weren't traveling that were doing their sets on Instagram live. Like you saw a lot of people that were, I saw uh, ballerinas that I knew from the, um, you know, from the New York City Ballet that were teaching classes for free on Instagram. Like I saw like so much great humanitarian stuff happening. Yeah. For a while, Instagram became less about bikini photos and more about really helping people. And, yes. reaching out. And, you, and you got to hear a lot of people that you admire, public figures that you admire that would get on live on something and just talk about, you know, this is the weirdest thing, like really connecting with people that I'm also experiencing this and scared people that were scared and really wearing their emotions on their sleeve. And I think that people are still in these places of trying to heal probably children more than anyone. And they don't realize it yet, but totally. the children will probably really suffer. But I want to know from you, you know, what steps can people take today to improve their physical and their mental well-being? Mm, what are yes. some good things that you could get for people that haven't begun to start doing this? What would you say? What would be the first steps? First step is have a meditation practice because your awareness of yourself and your mind i mean as we're seeing because also we've all been cooped up and locked up and in quarantine it's us and our minds right and we have the ability to make our minds the greatest asset the greatest tool our best friend or our greatest enemy and it's our choice it's not it's the mind is neutral it's 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 a great tool we can choose what we want but meditation gives us awareness it gives us insight not only into our minds but also into our bodies and into our emotional well-being and I think it's the ultimate tool it's the one I use the most with clients that helps us start to understand all of the different opposing facets of us so once you have awareness so much can happen from that place right awareness is key that's always the first step in everything that's the practice to get you there so five minutes in the morning like no excuse. That's all you get. Just five minutes. Insight timer. Free meditations there. I have free meditations on YouTube. There are, I have a whole entire membership for meditation. There's so many different things you can do to start a practice. No excuse. Number one. <laughs> all right. Number one. And you know, more comes after that. But number one, I would say is your meditation practice. You learn so much about yourself. And when it comes to uh, your physical well-being do you think that needs to start with exercise or start with diet for your physical well-being mm -hmm. mm, that is a great question I would have to say damn mm. I almost said I almost said diet because we are what we eat right where our whole body has to be made up of, of nutrients we can't be depriving we have to be nourishing it doesn't mean you have to be restrictive but you have to be nourishing yourself and in the same breath I know I am the type of person that needs a physical activity and honestly I can go two days without moving in some way and it doesn't have to be like a hard workout but going on a walk jumping around like, yeah standing up oh my god I will be and I feel how heavy emotionally I start to feel and mentally and where my mind goes and it's even if I'm eating a bunch of healthy nourishing things I don't feel good so for me they're so they you need both I can't yeah. tell you I well it's both. a loaded question <laughs> yeah it's a, it's question a loaded where, question I ask people this a lot because it's really kind of maybe that which came first the chicken or the egg type situation because some people yeah. will say one is more important than the other Mm. And, uh, and then a lot of people will say, try to do both at the same time, if you can, and, and whatnot. I just put yeah. out a, a book uh, called physiological attunement. And my philosophy on it is to, and this, of course, this is just my own personal philosophy on the whole thing. But yeah. I, I think you have to do, you have to get physically attuned before you get mentally attuned. I don't think you can really mm. get into a lot of the mental work without being physically in the right place. 
and it physically in the right place. I start with breathing, proper amount of water, proper amount of sleep, things like this before I ever get into diet and exercise, mm, because I feel like you have to discipline a lot of that breathing. You have to make sure that you're hydrated. You have to make sure you're getting the sleep or the mental work won't work the way it could. So I, yes. I feel like there is a certain amount of, you have to get your body ready to get the best mental work. And that's yes. my thinking on it. And of course, everyone in our world, we all sort of craft something our own way, kind of those magic ingredients that work. And that's yeah. this, what worked for me. Um, mm. But I, I often wonder if there is anything that science can provide that shows whether there is an order. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Would work first because people don't even think of their breath. They don't even think of their breath. No, I know. Sometimes they, you don't even witness it until you are in a yoga class or you are in meditation that you're even acknowledging what your breath is like and how off or wrong it can be. Yeah, it's so true. I like how you're. I like how you're thinking of this, and I think it's there are maybe many different starting points for people. Mm-hmm. That's the thing where some somebody got into you know a cardio class they took that changed their whole life from the inside or out or outside in whatever some people are like you know this one meditation spoke to me this one quote with this one amazing plant-based recipe that changed my life and I decided to -hmm. become you know whatever that it's wherever your starting point is whatever sparks you just be open to it and realize that you don't have to have all the answers uh, and there's no one size fits all. I think well, that's my, I mean, that not, I think that is my slogan is there's no one size fits all. There's no one yeah. size fits you. So you're exactly right. Whatever the entry point is, all the dots will connect. Yes. They're eventually yeah. all going to connect. You know, the breath work is going to connect with this and it is going to connect. It does. It, so it depends on where you come in, whether it is that quote or that class you took or that experience that you had, the dots will eventually connect, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Tell me about your skincare life. Yeah. So Mukama Botanica, I launched when I was in a college. I always joke, I was fully a teen mom um, starting this brand and I had this amazing vision for it. And um, it started actually sort of by accident. I was always into natural beauty, always making my own skincare, fully afraid of chemicals. <laughs> like my mom made me read a book at 12 years old about all the things that go in your skin and your body. So I was very conscious of that from a young age. And it just so happened, um, I actually have a degree in fashion design and I just finished my fashion degree. And I was like, mm, I... I'm really disheartened by this industry. There is so much waste. There is so much pollution. There's so much unethical stuff going on. What do I do? So I took a hiatus. I was lucky enough to go back home to Maui. And I stayed there for a whole summer by myself in the jungle. And I just started crafting. And it wasn't for, once again, anything else other than following the pole. And I ended up healing a bunch of superficial scarring on my skin that I had from stress picking my skin and through guava, um, just through my favorite fruit that we always grew up eating off our trees. And I put it on my skin and I had so such impeccable results that I started doing the research. It spun me into this entire lifelong. I'm actually looking up at my bookshelf right now of like 500 botanical books on skincare and healing. And I basically just self-educated and then got a degree in beauty from the same school I was going to and launched a skincare line. So um, I have two SKUs right now, two products at the moment, and we are growing. We will continue to grow. It's been me and that and me and coaching. So I'm always dividing my time between the two, but oh my gosh, I think it's such a beautiful ritual to have skincare as a part of your self-care um, sure. and learning to re-nourish yourself in those ways. Yeah. You so, know, yeah. growing up in that, uh, you know, that Pacific triangle, if that's what we're calling it, you, do you, do you um, are you anti-sun? Tell me your oh. feelings on that. Cause you had to have grown Ooh. up with a lot of sun. <laughs> is it your oh. friend or is it your oh. enemy? Good question. I'm about to tell you something crazy. Um, okay. Grew up with sun all my life. Totally never wore sunscreen. And as you see, I was in a pretty like low latitude, hot sun, tons of damage. So does it damage your skin over time? Yes. Do we need sun? Yes. 
it is like it's like the mind i think the sun can be neutral it can be it can be good it can be evil it's it depends mm-hmm. so it's just for me it's finding um i mean they're actually are amazing studies that show that we need 15 minutes of no sunscreen sun exposure per day preferably first thing in the morning and i swear by that too like living in puerto rico i will go out into the balcony or i'll go out on a quick walk let the sun soak into my body my skin and it feels so good it really like people are vitamin d deficient now so we need sun for most people listening you're probably not worrying about sun damage you're probably vitamin more on the vitamin d deficiency side i know so many people living in los angeles california that were like i'm depressed took a vitamin d supplement got some sun fine so might not be your fix all but just consider that but we do need sunscreen for most other hours of the day, you still need that 15 minutes. You also need sunscreen. (laughs) (laughs) So all of the above, um, the crazy thing I was going to tell you, which, you know, we just met today, Todd, but, um, have you ever heard of sunning of sunning? No, I don't think so. Okay. So in the Taoist tradition, they believe that your perineum Yes, your perineum, a uh, super sacred portal place. Uh-huh. And that this area is so receptive to like vitamin exposure and all kinds of sacred ritual that um, I had a series of issues from kidney infection to all these other things going on, urinary tract, super weird, unexplained, couldn't figure it out. And I had this voice in my head telling me, you got to try sunning. And I'd heard of this and I was like, no way, this is weird. But I kept hearing it, kept hearing it. You basically (laughs) expose the parts to the sun and you get a euphoric head high. I can't even explain it to you, Todd, but uh, for anyone listening, don't bash it till you try it. I'm writing a blog post on it. It's coming out this Wednesday. It's a very vulnerable it's literally life-changing. So the sun is so healing and it is honestly something that, yeah, we, we need the nutrients from it. We need to get out with it. Research sunning if you haven't already. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, you know, it often worries me that the damage caused by sunscreen could possibly be worse than the sun itself. <laughs> Oh, I hear you. The cleanest is the best because it's not only bad for us if it's not, but it's bad for our reefs. It's bad for our environment. So that's why my whole slogan with my skincare is selfless self-care. If you're taking care of yourself in any way, you better make sure it's not taking away from anything else. Um, So there are good brands. Any any chemicals out there, you know, we can't use baby powder. (laughs) We're going to give all the babies cancer, like, like everything, like it's insane. It's so nasty. Yeah, you really got to do your due diligence and like EWG.com where you check the ingredients, um, where you check the brands and get their rating is so key. If you guys aren't already doing that, like everybody should be checking out what they're putting on their skin. Tell me about your uh, your teaching, your workshops, your retreats, things like that. Yeah. So um, I am coaching remotely at the moment. I'm always planning retreats in the background. Um, so now that COVID is, you know, not, not over, but we have some freedoms. I really am trying to plan something in the next few months. So we'll see what comes out of that. Um, nothing on the books now, but everything I do, you can work, people can work with me one-on-one remotely from anywhere in the world. You can also join any of my programs. I have a self-care school that you basically online learn how to take care of yourself and tend to those different facets, those different dimensions of self that I mentioned that are so important for your holistic well-being. Um, I also have a Moo membership, which, well, it is called the Moo membership. It's named for the house that I grew up in on Maui that changed my life, where I found my deepest spirituality and self-healing and it's a whole membership with all of my favorite tools for wellness so you go for over 100 meditations being updated weekly for live stream classes that we do with members only for um for plant-based recipes that are my favorite that changed my life when I talked about that one recipe that like changes your life I'm putting all of those in that changed my life um and some conversations on spirituality and health and all that so that's the space. And it's all very digital right now. I do miss people in person though. I'm craving that. So yeah. 
And how can people find you out there on the interwebs? Oh my gosh. On the interwebs, you can just type in my name, Kama Hagar, K-A-N-A-H-A-G-A-R. And that's my website, kmahagar.com. That's my Instagram handle. Um, you can find basically anything, Facebook, et cetera. But I'd say those are my three main, my website, my Insta, my Facebook for all updates and good stuff that I'm putting out. Lots of free content, Wednesday free meditations on my Instagram, or sorry, Tuesday morning free meditations on my Instagram. So yeah, just here, here to help. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today. What a great interview. And uh, let's talk again soon. Yeah, it was so nice to meet you, Todd. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd Fisher, the host of the Cult Following Podcast. Cult Following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers. Get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective through exhaustive research and from interviews with people that were there. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure and visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.